9. Uh, if you want to uh, get ready, we're going to be in Luke 19 and Nehemiah 8 as well. Luke 19 and Nehemiah 8. <clears throat> so, as I uh, stated uh, last week, um, you know, this is probably one of the most important, and I know that's hard to say when you're talking about the Bible, because it's all important, uh, and, and to be able to, to quantify what's more important over other things is, is probably uh, not a fair statement to make, but uh, man, uh, this is a very important prophecy, and, and let's just leave it at that, and, 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 and making sure, number one, that we understand it, making sure that we put it in its proper place, uh, making sure that uh, uh, we give a, a, a biblical, uh, get a biblical bearing on it is, uh, as you're going to see at the end, uh, is, is, is really uh, very uh, high on the list. Like I said last week, there's, there's probably uh, two places where I would say, man, if you really want to get somebody's theological understanding of the Bible and what they think, uh, to go, uh, you know, Revelation 11, uh, 12, and Daniel 9 are the, are the places. Uh, so tonight we're going to look at Daniel 9 and we're going to get a feel for what's going on here. And I think uh, when we're done, uh, uh, hopefully uh, I'll be able to give you the, uh, the clear understanding of why this is so important. Okay? Uh, so Daniel 9, let's get the, let's get the picture of what's going on. <clears throat> Daniel has been uh, taken into captivity uh, uh, from, from Babylon, uh, literally from this point here in Daniel 9, 68 years prior. So he's been in captivity now uh, for 68 years uh, under the, uh, the, the, the Babylonian, and then now uh, it's been, uh, uh, the, the Medio persian Empire has now taken over since then. Uh, if you remember last week, we were looking at those seven heads, the one that was going to follow Babylon was the Medio Persian Empire, and that's where we are now in the timeline of things. Uh, the the, the Medio Persian Empire is in control, and 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 they're coming close to the end of the seventy years of what Jeremiah had prophesied that was going to uh, how long uh, Israel was going to be uh, in captivity uh, to, uh, to uh, Babylon. And you're going to see here, there we go. So in Jeremiah, uh, right, it says here, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass, when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolation. So Daniel uh, is, is recalling what the prophet Jeremiah uh, had written uh, probably by this point about 100 years earlier, okay? Uh, Jeremiah uh, was the prophet during the Babylonian captivity in the early parts of the northern kingdom being taken into captivity, okay? So that was around 606 B.C. We're, run, we're running now 68 years later. Is everybody with me now? All right, so when you get to Daniel 9, what happens is he knows that the time is now coming to, the, the 70 years is coming to an end. And so if you look here, uh, I'm just going to, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to make some points here. It says here in the first year of Darius, uh, and he, of course he was the, uh, uh, the son of uh, Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes. So there's your Median, Medio Persian Empire, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, uh, I, Daniel, understood by the book of number of years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So you see how he's referencing that now? Okay, so he knew that, okay, it's coming to an end, now what? And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord... The great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned. All right, let's stop because we got to get something really clear about this chapter now. Daniel is, is from what nation? 
he's a Jew. He's, he's from the nation of Israel. So when he says, we have sinned, who is he talking about? The nation of Israel. You say, oh, well, of course, Pastor, we got that. I mean, come on, keep going. I'm just letting you know that's important to know. Because when you get down to the actual prophecy itself, you've got to keep in, 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 in context to who he's talking about. Because a lot of people take this Daniel 9 prophecy and they insert the church. And that's why I want to be very, very clear. It is not the church. It's Israel. Okay? This, this whole thing is called replacement theology, if you haven't heard of it. Okay? Or covenant theology. Very, very dangerous doctrine that's being taught in probably 95% of our churches in these last days. And I'm not joking when I say that. I'm very serious. It's a very, very dangerous doctrine. It's very important to understand that God is not done with Israel. God has not replaced Israel with the church. If you think that, you're going to have to spiritualize a whole lot of Bible. And once you do that, you now become the interpreter of the Bible, and God's no longer the interpreter of the Bible. You see why that's so dangerous? Amen. And do you understand why I'm, why I'm making this a point? Yes. To say, listen, I understand, you know, we shouldn't, you know, people get all upset when you start calling out other churches and stuff like that, but listen, I don't stand for other churches, I stand for the word of the Lord. I stand for God. And if, if, if in preaching God's word, it calls out a doctrine of another church, well, that's not my problem. That's their problem. They've got to deal with that. You understand? I don't mean that to be ugly, but, but we're not here to make friends with churches that are teaching wrong doctrine. We're here to make friends with our Lord <laughs> and teach his doctrine. Amen? And I'm not trying to be ugly about that, but at the same time, uh, it is important that we understand it. Okay, so he says uh, uh, that we, we have sinned, Israel. Uh, uh, we have committed iniquity, verse 5. And so he, he starts to pray for the nation of Israel. He starts to say, you know, basically, I'm just going to give you a paraphrase of what's going on here. He basically says, you know, uh, look at verse 18. Oh, my God, incline thy ear and hear, open thy eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. Okay, what, what is the city that's called by his name? Come on, help me. Jerusalem. Very good. Okay, so it's very, very clear what he's talking about. For we do not present our supplications before our righteousness, before thy great mercies. And so he's now praying because he knows that, there, that 70 years is coming to a close and that, okay, what's going to happen now? What, what's next for Israel? That's what Daniel's praying for, you understand, okay? And so look what, look what God does in verse number 21. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I have come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. You remember I told you who was the other guy that, 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 that was said about? The Apostle John, and he wrote what book? The book of Revelation, Okay. And he says, therefore, and understand the matter and consider the vision. So Gabriel's the same guy who came to Mary to announce the, 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 the birth of Christ and that the Holy Ghost was going to come upon her. Okay, you, you, that, this is the same Gabriel here. Okay, so Gabriel comes and, and, and he, it, he gives Daniel this mind-blowing prophecy. Daniel thought that there was two years left in the desolation of Israel. What Gabriel's about to give him is the complete timeline of Israel till the second coming of Christ. That's what, he's, that's what he's about to get. So this is huge, right? This is huge, okay? Uh, uh, so notice verse 24. We're going to try to take this step by step. He says, 70 weeks are determined... Upon thy people. Okay, so j now, remember, who's thy people? Okay, so where in this at all is the church? I mean, nowhere at all was the church ever mentioned anywhere. At no point did it ever even get brought up 
if you go back and you read the, the previous verses, if you want to do it on your own time, you're never going to be able to contrive the church in that unless you place the church in there on a preconceived idea. That's the only way you're going to get the church in this passage. Okay? And look what it says now. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Okay, what's the holy city? What's the holy city? Jerusalem. Is everybody with me now? So we're talking about, we're not, we're not talking about, I'm not trying to be funny, I'm trying to tell you what people teach. We're not talking about the church, and we're not talking about Rome. Y'all with me on that? that? That's not the holy city. The holy city is Jerusalem. The, the, the holy people are, are Israel. That, that's what we're talking about. It has never gotten off of that. And it says that there are, there are certain things that are going to happen to these people. To finish the transgress, transgression. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision and prophecy. And to anoint the most holy. So, those things, are, that when the 70 weeks are complete, those things will all be complete. All right, let's, let's I, I don't want to go through each one of them and, and really dig into them. I just want to make a couple quick points. Okay. Has the transgression of Israel been finished yet? Anybody? No. Has there been an end of sin? No. Okay, uh, 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 ha has everlasting righteousness been brought in yet? No. Ha has, has the, so, th so therefore then, has the vision and the prophecy been sealed up yet? No. Okay, please hear what I'm about to tell you. 95% of churches are going to teach you that it has. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you that's what they'll tell you. They will say that this all took place during the time of the Roman Empire. And I'm here to tell you, some of it took place in the time of the Roman Empire, but some of it has not taken place yet. Y'all with me? I'm going I'm to prove it to you in a minute, okay? I'll let the Bible prove it to you in a minute. But I just want to make sure y'all understand, I'm not trying to be ugly, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not trying to call out, I'm just trying to be true to what the Scripture says. Because it's important that we are, okay? This, this is very important that we grab onto this. So now, look what it says here uh, uh, in verse number 25. Because now we have this target. All right, now watch. Knowing therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks. All right, so let's, let's get a little historical understanding real quick. Grab on to this, okay? When Babylon came into uh, uh, Israel and took over Israel in 606 B.C., it completely wiped Israel out. It destroyed it. Nineteen years later... In 587 B.C., when it came into Jerusalem, it destroyed the temple and tore down all the, the, uh, the walls. So the city of Jerusalem has been completely destroyed. The temple has been destroyed. You understand? So now, here we are, 68 years later, whatever it is, okay? And, 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 and Daniel's praying because he says, hey, 70 years... Okay, we're about to go back into our land. This is about to get taken care of, right? We're, it's almost over. And God's coming. God sends Gabriel to give him this vision. And he says, okay, the, this is, 70 weeks are determined. And so immediately Daniel probably looked up at that and said, oh, 70 years. Okay, we got it. Good. We're almost done. Hold. No. Watch what's, go, we're gonna, watch what's going on here because this is going to be a far bigger sco scoping thing that's, that, that, that's happening. But what he says is there's going to be a commandment, the target, there's going to be a commandment that's going to be issued to do what? Rebuild what? Rebuild the city. Why? Who's coming? 
Look at the passage. Who's coming? The Messiah is coming. Y'all got that? Why? Because Messiah is coming. All right, and, and, and when was Jesus born? Roughly, and a lot of people argue this, but we'll just put 2 BC up there for the sake of argument. Okay, Jesus was born somewhere around 2 BC. Okay, and, 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 so Messiah is coming. Right, so the target that's going to start this whole prophecy, okay, going the 70 weeks that he's, 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 he's uh, uh, letting know is going to happen, what's going to start it is when the commandment goes forth to allow, and now somebody did say it, Nehemiah, <laughs> and Ezra, by the way, because that's what the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra is all about. Nehemiah is all about rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, Ezra's all about rebuilding the temple. You understand? Okay? There's going to be a, there's going to be somebody who's going to allow and put forth a commandment that's going to start this trigger of this prophecy. Does everybody understand what's going on here? Is that pretty, pretty easy to grab onto? Okay. So let's, let's, let's kind of grab onto what he's talking about for a second and get the target when it starts. Keep your place in, in, uh, in Isaiah, uh, not Isaiah, don't, don't do that, Daniel, because we're going to come back to it. But go with me now to Nehemiah chapter number 2, because this is when it's going to happen. And a watch. So there's this king, okay, uh, uh, his name is Artaxerxes. You may know his, uh, his grandfather. His grandfather was Esther's husband. Remember Esther? That, that, that nice lady? Got that? Okay. So our tax Xerxes. Okay. Very important to understand this. Okay. Even by secular, even the secular world knows this. His reign over Media Persia began in 465 BC. Okay. Everybody with me on that? This is how precise God is. This is why you got to love it. This is why this book is so awesome. God throat. There's certain times in the Bible where God makes a point to give you something. He doesn't do it often. Like, he doesn't tell us when Jesus was born. Right? We, he doesn't tell us in the Bible when he died. We only know that he died 33 years after he was born. But we don't know from the Bible the year he was born or the year he was, that he died. Although I would say we do, because this prophecy is about to tell us, but that's beside the point. But we don't get an actual dating, if you will. Right here, God does something really weird. It's, it's almost abnormal. He actually does give us a dating on something. Why? Because he's trying to pinpoint something for us so that we grab onto it. Look what he says here in Nehemiah 2. And it came to pass in the month Nisan. Does anybody know what the month Nisan is correlated to us? It's a Jewish month. It's April, March, April, pending. Because This is very important you understand this, okay? When you're studying your Bible, you have to understand something about the Jewish calendar. They go by 360 days. It wasn't until 700 AD when the Gregorian calendar came into effect that we started going by 365 days. And then every fourth year is a leap year. So if you're ever going to try to do something and get it biblically right, you've got to do it by this, not by our years. If you do it by our years, you're going to throw yourself all off. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? You've got to do it by the biblical reckoning of, of things. Okay? So uh, the sign, okay, if you remember the Passover over in Exodus chapter number 12, it was in the month of Nisan. They were to take the Passover lamb on the tenth of the on the tenth of Nisan, right? And then they were to inspect it for four days. And then on the fourteenth of Nisan, they were to kill it. Y'all remember this, right? And then, by the way, on the seventeenth of Nisan, you celebrated the first fruits. You say, why are you telling me this? Because this tells you exactly what when Jesus actually died. He didn't die on a Friday, my friends. Y'all know that, right? 
Y'all know that, right? The Bible actually teaches us when he died. That's a whole other story. Uh, if we got time and you want to pay me for it, I'll tell you. Okay. Check it out now. What I want you to grab onto is the month of Nisan, okay, it's the Passover. Jesus died on the Passover. Y- y'all remember this? Right? So he died in the month of Nisan. I want you to make sure you keep track of this. Uh, I think it's only one out, sorry. Now watch. It says here, in the 20th year of our tax Xerxes. Okay, so look, everybody look. So if, if he started his reign in 465, and we're in the 20th year of his reign, what year is it? Because remember, we're BC, so we got to count down. So now watch. This commandment came in 445 BC in the month of Nisan. Y'all with me? We're, we're just taking Bible right now. We're just laying it out exactly as it says. And so what happens here, as you read through this passage, what uh, 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 Artaxerxes our taxi, our does is Nehemiah is the king's uh, wine uh, taster. So in other words, you know, Nehemiah has to taste his wine before the king drinks it to make sure it's not poison. Okay? And, and so the king... Uh, verse 2 says unto Nehemiah, Why is thy countenance so sad, seeing you are not sick? Is there no, nothing but sorrow of a heart that I was very sore afraid? And I said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste and gates thereof are consumed with fire? Okay, what city is he talking about? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Then the king said to me, For why does, what dost thou make requests? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If I please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me to Judah, to the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let the letters be given to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber, Okay, so y'all get what's going on here. So, so a covenant is made in Nisan 445 BC that allows Nehemiah, the king allows Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. Okay, what, what did Daniel say? When the commandment goes forth to rebuild the city. Why? Messiah's coming. That's when this starts. Everybody with me right now so far? Okay. Let's keep going. Go with me, if you will. Hang again. Go with me, if you will, to Luke chapter number 19. <clears throat> Luke chapter number 19. I want to show you what's going on here and grab onto this. And we're going to see how this connects back to the Daniel, Daniel prophecy in a minute. So if you remember Luke 19, okay, Luke 19 is the event that we call the triumphal entry of Jesus. It's, it's when Jesus gets on the back of that donkey and he rides into Jerusalem and all the, the, uh, the uh, 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 Israelites are standing there waving the, the palms going, what were they saying? Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Does anybody know why they were doing that? It, 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 there was a prophecy that this was going to happen, right? Check it out. Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And then Psalm 118, it says, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So, listen, you have to understand something about Jesus' life. It it is actually crucial that you get this if you don't already got it. Every single thing he did was in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Everything he did, he was doing in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. There's no way one man's life could do that 
and fulfill Old Testament prophets, it's one of the most surefire ways you can believe your Bible. Amen. Because there's just no way. There's no way one man can fulfill all of these prophecies. Okay? But this is what he's doing. And so what happens is he rides in uh, on the donkey that day, and they're waving the, 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 uh, the uh, 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 palms, right? And look what it says here. Uh, look at verse 38. Uh, it says here, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And now watch, okay, because the Pharisees totally understood what was going on right now. And some of the Pharisees from the Mount of Multitude said on him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Okay, they, you better believe the Pharisees knew those verses right there. And you better believe they knew exactly what Jesus was doing. And they're like, you better stop them right now. And look what Jesus says. I tell you that if these hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Okay, do you understand what Jesus is saying back to them? I couldn't stop them even if you wanted me to. Prophecies being fulfilled. And when God says it, you may as well just stamp it as sure as done. Okay, so Jesus rides in on that donkey on the 10th of Nisan. Now, does anybody remember what we call this? Palm Sunday? Right? Okay. Now, just here's free, you don't have to pay me. So this was Sunday, and he was killed on the 14th of Nisan, which was the Passover. What day would that have been? That'd be a Thursday. And if he was resurrected on the first fruit, of the, he was resurrected on Sunday. Well, there you go. Your Bible just gave it to you. And now what people are going to tell you is, well, no, wait a minute. He died. He died on the Passover. Uh, but John say, comes in and saves the day because here's the deal. There's actually seven high Sabbath days in a year. And the seven high Sabbath days in the year are the seven feasts of the Lord. Which, by the way, the seven feasts of the Lord are all prophecy in their own right. That Sabbath was a high Sabbath, so it wasn't a Friday. It was whatever day it landed on, and in this particular year, it landed on a Thursday. I'm just showing you what your Bible says. You do whatever you want with that information. Okay, that was free. Here we go. Let's get back to the, what, what, what we got going on here. So Jesus uh, tells him, hey, I, I can't stop them. Even the stones would cry out. Now look what, he, what happens in verse 42. It says, if thou hast known, even thou at least this thy day, things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even to the ground, uh, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Why? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. In other words... Understand what Jesus is doing right now to the Pharisees. He's holding them accountable for not knowing Daniel's prophecy. That's what he's doing. He's saying, Daniel prophesied when I was going to ride in on this donkey. And you didn't know it. And now you're going to have to pay the price. Which, by the way, we might want to learn from that. If he held Israel, you don't think he's going to hold us responsible too? Huh? Of course he is. Okay? So, so okay, grab on to that now. Okay? So we got this, 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 uh, this whole thing going on with um, Jesus riding in on the donkey. So let's go back to Daniel 9 now and bring this all kind of together and, grab, and get what, 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 what this 70 weeks is all about. So... He says here, right, that seven weeks and, uh, uh, or uh, 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 knowing therefore and understand, verse 25, that when the commandment comes to restore and build Jerusalem and the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Okay, so what's three score? You remember Abraham Lincoln, four scores? And, 
right? What's a score? Score is 20 years, so what's three score? Three score in two weeks, so that's 62 weeks, plus the seven, how many weeks are being determined right now? 62 plus seven. So, when Messiah the Prince rides in on that donkey, it's going to be 69 weeks. Everybody with me? Okay, now you're sitting there going, now wait a minute. I thought you told me that this prophecy started in 445 B.C. I'm not a smart person, but I can figure out that it takes, it's a little bit more than 69 weeks from 445 B.C. to when Jesus rode in on that donkey, which I'm going to tell you, Jesus died in 32 A.D., but we'll get there in a second, okay? How, what's going on here, bro? <laughs> There's more than 69 weeks. We got to do something with that. Okay, well, here again, this is why we got to go to our Bibles to figure things out. Okay, remember last week when I told you the Jewish rendering of time? Time, times, and time and a half, and how they do that, right? Remember, that's three and a half years, right? Another way that the Jews render time is in this thing called weeks. Okay, and we grab onto it from Genesis. Watch this now. Very important. Jacob, who's Jacob? Right? You remember, you remember when Jacob went to, to, to Laban there? And he said, oh, I want to marry your daughter. You know, that, 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 that fine young lady, Rachel, I want to marry her. And, and, and he says, okay, yeah, you can marry her. That's no problem. Okay, but, but here's, here's the deal, right? He, he tricks her. And he marries Lee instead. Right? And so now look what happens. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee, how long? For Rachel, thy younger daughter. Drop down, look, verse 27. Fulfill her week, and will give thee also for the service which thou serve with me yet. All right, we just found something out here. What's a week? Seven years. So now hold on a minute now. So now this isn't 69 weeks as we see it. This is 69 times 7 years. Now, let's do it the easy way. What's 70 times 7? 490. Everybody good there? Right? Did you say 460? No. Oh, okay. Thank you for doing the better way to do that. Gotcha. So 70 times 7 is 490. So what would be 69 times 7? All we got to do is subtract. So we have 483 years. By the way, notice one thing. What are we missing? That 70th week, which is, and there's where you're going to get your tribulation from when we get there. Okay? But now watch. He says 69 times 7, 483 years. Now, you remember what I told you? What you got to make sure you do is you, if you're trying to put things in, a, in our calendar, you got to go by. So when you take 483 times 360, what you get is 173,880 days. Okay? Now, here's the fun part. If you go from the 10th of Nisan, and, and I, I'm so dumb I did this, and backtrack 173,888 days, guess what you come to? Nisan first, 445 BC. What do you want to do with that? Go ahead, do something with that all the namesayers on the Bible. What are you going to do with that? It literally, 173,888 days to the 10th of Nisan, 32 uh, 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 AD, is 173,000. You say, wait a minute now. Everyone says Jesus died in 33 AD, so, you, so you're off by a year. Well, now watch this. Take 483. Take, uh, uh, how do we want to do this? Take 445 B.C. All right, watch. This is what you got to do. Take 173,000. Grab me a calculator. 
So I'm going to get a calculator real quick and do this so that everyone can hear somebody else say it. Got one? Put in 173,880 173, days. 173,880 days. Yep. Okay. Divide, it, divide it by 365. What's that number right there? 476.3. Got that? 476.3. Watch this now, my friends. Now, take 445. Take 445. But you got to put minus 445 because we're... Oh, 476 minus 445. No, no, no. No, no. You listen to what I'm telling you. Okay. Take minus 445. Oh, minus... Because we're... And now plus 476. Plus 476. 31. You did that wrong. Who, who did it right? 31. Now watch. When you go from B.C. to A.D., very important you understand something, okay? It didn't go to zero. It went from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., so you always got to... Depending on how you do it, either add or subtract one year. Because we're doing it the opposite way, we want to add a year. What, go ahead. What's 31 plus 1? Oh, my. That's in your Bible. Did you know that? That's in your book. The Bible announced exactly when Jesus was going to ride in on that donkey. The exact day. Then literally four days later, on the 14th of Nisan, he was killed. Because look what it says here. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be, verse 26, shall be what? Cut off, but not for himself. Okay, was Messiah cut off and not for himself? Y'all remember what Jesus did, right? He died for the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which took away the sin of the world. Huh? Now watch, because the very next part of this verse is very important, and notice there's a what right there after himself. Does everybody see that? What did, what did, in the English language, why do they put that there? It's like a pause, and the next statement is a part of the statement, and not necessarily uh, an extension of the statement. Because what happens is, from that point right there, where that pause is, that's where we are right now. We're living in the pause. Y'all got it? This is the dispensation of grace. When Jesus died on the cross, something happened. God put a time clock. It's like a chess move, right? He stopped time for Israel. Why? Because Israel did something. They rejected their Messiah. You understand? And now we enter into a period of time called the church age. And when we're in this church age, God doesn't count time, if you will. Not like he did with Israel. So now what happens is, when Messiah got cut off, what happened to the last seven years? It got put on hold. And we're waiting for it. We're waiting for the 70th week of Daniel to begin. What's going to be the... Here, you know, here, here we go. Come on, let's play. All the people that think the mid-trib and the post-trib rep, let's play. Okay, what do you think is going to be the very thing that's going to trigger the 70th week of Daniel? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the church? It's got to be removed. It has to be removed. Because that's the only way God's going to start the time clock again because it's going to all everything be pointed back on Israel again. It's almost like God wrote this book. It's almost like he did. Oh, because he did. Amen? All right, so, so we, get this, uh, we get this whole thing here, right, to the very day uh, of, of uh, when this was going to happen. Now watch what it says here. Did that fall off my head? Watch what it says here. And the people 
of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay. Very important that we grab on to what, that, what that's saying right there. Who, when was Israel and the, temp, the second temple destroyed? So yeah, you got it. King Herod's temple, the second temple, which Haggai ends up rebuilding, right? Because in the process of all this, the second temple gets rebuilt. Why? Because who was coming? Okay. Now, there's going to be no need for a temple for the next 2,000 years because it's the church age. So what happens? The, who came in and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed that second temple? Anybody know? Huh? Titus uh, of Rome. Now look what it says here. And the people of the prince, lowercase p, that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So who would be the people of the prince that shall come? Now you remember that? Remember when I told you? Remember I gave you that, those six heads? And I said that six head, something really unique happens with that six head. When it becomes a seventh head, it's what? Rome 2. Who's going to rise and take power at Rome 2? The little horn? Who, what do we call that guy? The Antichrist. That's what he's talking about right here. And he's letting us know the Antichrist is going to come from the people of, the, of who? Of Rome. He's letting us know. Now watch. And he says here, uh, and the end thereof shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Hang, hang, hang right there. Oh, you don't have to hang right there because I think I got it up for you here. Check this out. Remember Revelation chapter 12? Remember when I showed you Revelation chapter 12 and we were looking at the, 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 the woman, the child, and the dragon? Remember that? And who is the dragon? Satan. And you remember... Something was going to happen to the dragon where he was going to get cast. Remember, Michael, the archangel, is going to have a battle with him, and he's going to get cast, right? When? After three and a half, in the second half of the tribulation period. Y'all remember this? Right? And what's going to happen in the second half of the tribulation period? What is the dragon then going to attempt to do to Israel? Kill him. Look, check it out. And to the woman, who's the woman? were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place <laughs> for how long? For a time, time. Oh boy. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a... What does that say right there? A flood that he might cause her to be carried away with a flood. Okay, go back to Daniel 9 now. And look what it says there. That the prince shall come to destroy the city and sanctuary, the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So you see where, where the connection is now? And so where are we? We're in the second half of the tribulation, and now Daniel's going to confirm we're in the second half of the tribulation in the very next verse. Look what it says. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? One week. Because look, we're... We're waiting for that. We're looking for that other 70th week right there. And look what it says here. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and the, de and the term shall be poured upon the desolate. So what he's telling us is that in the middle of this week, come on, what's the middle of the week, folks? You see why you got to take these two books and bring them together? Because they're working together. And if you want to connect the dots, you got to get the two books together. And you'll start connecting the dots. What's going to happen in the middle of the week? What is, what, and what does Jesus say? If you're in Matthew chapter 24, if you remember, Jesus brings up his boys up into the mountain there. And the boys ask him a, a very, very interesting question that I don't understand why we aren't paying more attention to. Because they basically go to Jesus, hey, what's going to be the end of the world and what's going to be the sign of your coming? And he answered them. We might want to pay attention to his answer. Yeah? 
And in the midst of that answer, he says, And when you shall see, therefore, the abomination of desolation, as spoken by Daniel the prophet, he that he has ears to hear, let him understand. When you see that, run to the mountains. Where are they running to? To the mountains. By the way, where do y'all remember where they're going to run to? Remember I told you? Petra? The wilder, it's in the wilderness, Petra, right? And that's where God's going to feed them just like he did when? In the Exodus. That's why that Exodus story is so important. And by the way, isn't it interesting how God describes the Exodus back in, I think it's Exodus where he says it, where he says that I carried you like on, on eagle's wings. You see what I'm saying? Just let the book, just let the book do it. We don't have to do this. We don't have to make stuff up. Just let the book do it. And it'll, it'll take care of all the interpretation for us every single time. Amen? All right. So the last thing I want to say here, okay, is this. This is why covenant theology is so very dangerous. God is not done with Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. Literally 95% of churches today teach some form of covenant theology. The majority of Roman Catholic churches teach it, including all the Reformed churches. Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, the names go on and on. The majority of Calvinistic churches teach this. The JWs, Jehovah Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons all teach some form of this. And sadly, even Baptist churches are falling into this trap in these last days. And just in case, just so we make sure we get the last little piece in there, non-denominational churches, listen, there is no such thing as a non-denominational church. Come on, man. There isn't. All you got to do is go on their website and look at what they believe and what denomination they're coming from. Okay? They can call themselves non-denominational all they want, but they're getting their doctrine from somewhere. You understand? Okay, Without, whoever did that website is pulling their doctrine from somewhere. Okay, so let's just get clear about all that. Listen, this book is awesome. It really is. The fact that God was able to call this stuff out in advance. Now, now do you understand why when I told you a few weeks back that those Dead Sea Scrolls were so very vitally important? Because what book was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Daniel. And they dated them back to four or 500 B.C., long before any of these events ever happened. So what you can't do is say, oh, the book of Daniel was written after the fact. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Good stuff? Yes. Okay, so now, how many of us know that there's going to be a seven-year tribulation? Raise your hand, please. How many of us know now when somebody says, hey, can you prove to me there's going to be a, 70, uh, a seventh week of Daniel? Now, now how many of us can say, I can show you? Okay, that's a much better, I like that, but that, that, that's better. This is what we're waiting for, my friends. This is what we're waiting for. And, and let me just say this, and I'm done, and I'm sorry we're a little over, I know, tonight. Um, uh, but I, wa I do need to say this because I think it's important you all understand this. This is critical. Last little piece that I want to make sure you understand. When Jesus died on the cross, okay, everything that took place leading up to his death on the cross Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everything that took place up to his death was under Old Testament economy. I know we're in the New Testament, but Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. So if you go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in prior to Jesus' death on the cross and try to pull doctrine for the church, be careful. I'm not saying you can't. As long as Paul 
reiterated it to the church. But what I am saying is, oh boy, be careful. Though that we were still under Old Testament law prior to Jesus' death on the cross. That point is made emphatically in Hebrews when it says that the new covenant is not ratified until the death of the testator. Y'all with me on that? Okay. Something really weird happened after that that is very important we grab onto. Okay? I know, I know I'm over, but make sure you listen to what I'm about to say because this is where another huge amount of biblical mist teaching is going on today. Okay? From the point that Jesus died on the cross until Paul comes on the scene. Everybody with me? Okay? Which would be roughly seven years later. Eight years later. Something around that area. Somewhere around 39 to 40 AD is when uh, Acts chapter number uh, 9 takes place. Okay? That period of time right there there was a transition going on. What was happening is God was still giving the Jew one more chance to accept their Messiah. That's why Peter, who is the apostle to the, the Jew, is the one that is at the focal point of all of, those, his, of all the preaching that's going on right there. And if you watch and are really careful about how Peter's preaching... What's he preaching about? You killed your Messiah. Okay, no, no disrespect, but did we kill our Messiah? The Gentile didn't kill the Messiah. We killed the Messiah spiritually through our sin. But, 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 but we didn't call for the Messiah's death, you understand? And that was the problem. And so that, that's what Peter is telling them. Hey, you killed your Messiah. And so constantly they keep coming back with, what do we do? Okay, the question's not, what must I do to be saved? That was the Philippian jailer over in Acts 16. The question was, we killed our Messiah, what do we do? Something very, very important happens in Acts chapter 7. Stephen is filled with the Holy Ghost. Y'all remember Stephen? And you remember Stephen standing in front of the Jewish council? And he gives them a whole Old Testament history story. Huh? He breaks... Because he ain't talking to the Gentiles. He's talking to who? The Jew. And you want to know what's really cool? Is right before Stephen gets stoned, he gets filled with the Holy Ghost, right? Y'all remember? And then, and then, oh, it looks like an angel's on him, right? And you remember what Jesus... You remember what he... I see Jesus standing. Hold on a minute. I thought Jesus sat at the right hand of God. Why is he standing? Let me tell you why. Because at that moment, they would have accepted what Stephen just said. The second coming of Christ would have happened right then and there. Because everything was in place for the second coming to happen. What'd they do? They stoned him. God says, okay, here we go. He scatters Israel now. Chapter number 9, here comes Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. The transition is now complete, and now we're moving into the church age. Now, the reason why I want you to understand that is, is because please, don't whatever you do, do not go to Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter 6 and try to get church doctrine. Because none of that was church doctrine at all. You go, well, why are you telling me that? Because you know how much false doctrine comes out of Acts chapter 2? Huh? Do you want to know why we teach you need to be baptized in water to be saved? Because of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Do you want to know why the teaching of, 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 of tongues and, and, and all that stuff is being taught in these last days? Because of what's going on in Acts chapter 2. They don't understand what the purpose of tongues was. They don't, they don't get it. It was never given to the church. It was given to the, to, to the Jew for a very specific purpose. Okay? Is everybody with me on all this? Now, 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 that's why this is all important to understand. Acts is not a church doctrine book. Acts is a transitional book. You're transitioning from 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Old Testament, to Romans. Because what's the next book? Romans, which teaches you on the subject of salvation. Y'all with me on this? Acts is a transitional book. Okay. Again, I say all this to say, listen to me very carefully. God is not done with Israel. God has put them on the shelf until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. When the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled, God's going to look to his right and he's going to say, okay, son, go get them. And the son is going to blow the trumpet and, 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 and the archangel is going to blow, the archangel is going to blow the trumpet, excuse me. Heaven's going to open because there's a frozen sea of glass right there. The door in heaven's going to open. The sun's going to come down into the, how far down is he going to come? The clouds. Where is he not going to come? He's not coming because it's not the second coming. Okay? It's the rapture of the church. He's going to come down. He's going to call everybody's name that's in Christ. And he's got to get the ones that are dead first because they're six feet under and they need a quick head start. <laughs> you understand? And he's going to call them up. And then everybody else that's in Christ is going to come up with them. They're going to get translated in the air, and forever they'll be with the Lord. And then as soon as that happens, down on earth, something's about to happen. Now, I don't know if there's not going to be a little period of time where there's another small transition back. I don't know because we aren't specifically told. I would probably lean to think it's going to be pretty close. But whatever's going to happen, the transition's going to take place, the Antichrist is now going to rise to power. He's going to make a covenant with Israel for seven years. He's going to give them the ability to go rebuild that temple, which, by the way, they're already ready to rebuild. They got the red hyphen and everything. They're ready to go, man. They're ready to rebuild it. Okay? And then as soon as that happens, the seven-year tribulation begins. Daniel's 70 weeks begins. Understand something. In that period of time, of that seven years, people are not saved the same way they're saved in this dispensation. In this dispensation, when you call upon the name of the Lord, the Holy Ghost comes inside of you and seals you until the day of redemption. In the tribulation period, it reverts back to what it was at the end of 69 weeks before Jesus died on the cross. Did the Holy Ghost fill people in the Old Testament? Nope. You see why now you can lose your salvation in the tribulation period? Because if you accept the mark of the beast, this is why this stuff is so vitally important to understand because in these last days, so much false doctrine is being taught in churches and it's leading people to hell and it's sad. It's very sad. It really is. Okay. You can tip me later. I accept cash and uh, I'll take credit cards. I mean, if you want to get